Extol the Lord. You getting warmed up? A little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Because God deserves the more, does he not? Amen. Amen. Welcome to Saturday evening week. Our uh, missions conference week end. And of course, our second our second day. What a great night we had last night. Looking forward to another wonderful night. And we have gotten off to a great, great start. Praise the Lord for uh, Pastor Dwayne and the worship and praise team. They are wonderful. All the musicians, thank you. Um, tech team behind the scenes, thank you. Sound peoples upstairs, peoples behind. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. And uh, of course, we'll be in Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Remember, this nice little brochure has your schedule of what we're going to be doing. Right now, we are on day two, as I said earlier. That means it's Saturday, and it is October 5. Drinks and dessert in the coffee house, all done. Special speaker Kevin Pesky, not done. But we're going to have you back again. Weren't you glad you came last evening and heard Pastor Kevin praise the Lord? Praise the Lord for what God delivered through his voice and vessel and looking forward to a, another evening in the word. But we're going to kick things off after, of course, we've had our praise and worship and a little time of prayer. Uh, we're going to have a, a young man by the name of Cody Walker. We decided um, last year, near the end of last year, into the beginning of this year, hey, we're going to go down and visit Cody somehow, some way, one of these days. And it's turned out that 2024 is our year to go visit, so a small team of seven of us will be headed down there at the end of this month, and uh, from what I understand, it's like a three-day flight, so we're going we're gonna to box away a number of days, but we're looking forward to it, Cody, and, and so as we were looking at our conference and things were coming together, Brian Clark being here last evening, what a blessing that was to have him for a few minutes. As he said, I'm glad that you allowed me to come and say thank you, and we thank the Lord for being in their corner. And of course, as we said, hey, Cody Walker is here. Of course, the Carters are here as well. We thought, okay, Cody, come on in for a few days. You were able to fly in, get mom and dad with you, which is awesome. And that's really cool to spend a few days. And why don't you come to our conference and, and spend a few minutes before uh, Pastor Kevin preaches on Saturday evening. And and just kind of tell us where you've been, again, where you're at today and where you're headed. And, and I know that if some of you keep up with emails and letters, you send out things frequently. And I'm very thankful for your communication. There's a group of people praying for you constantly in different ways. And of course, our Sunday morning prayer group that gets together every Sunday for missions and prays on uh, the Sunday mornings at 8 a.m., you can be part church of those type of things, praying for missionaries, and this is one of them. Again, I'm going to just highlight this and get out of the way. In the center, uh, excuse me, as you open up the panel, on the right uh, panel on the inside, there's the list of missionaries that we support. And uh, I know that Alex, Chris, uh, Alex and Crystal aren't there. There's a reason for that, and I'll break that into that tomorrow in our commitment card for giving to missions in 2025. But here you have an opportunity to pray for missionaries. And of course, now that, hey, some of you met Brian Clark for the very first time, probably most of you said hi to Brian or heard him speak for the first time. He has been on the mission field 20 years and has hardly come back to the States. And so maybe, uh, maybe just maybe God will prick your heart for that relationship. Of course, with the Carters and them, they're, uh, gosh, they've been members of our church for 100 years and will always have a home here. And, and that is important. But Hey, some of you might not remember, Cody was here before. He only had one leg at that time. He grew back his leg. But Cody and Millie and his children, they have been serving on the mission field in Argentina for seven, eight, eight years now, is it not? Yes. And so without me taking away and ruining, let me get out of the way. Cody Walker, come please speak to us. I'll get It is a privilege to be with you guys tonight. <laughs> it's, it gets stranger and stranger and stranger to travel. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, coming on this trip, I, I landed in JFK. My first experience being back here in the U.S. was in the airport in JFK. And as I'm landing, I'm thinking, why did I leave home to come to this foreign country? Where, 
where is this place? This is so strange. And guys, that's what Argentina has become for us. You know, it's, it's hard to say that it's home because our home's not on this side of heaven, right? But it's hard to leave home and come back to you guys. Not that we don't like you guys. We love you guys and we're extremely grateful and we're, the words can't express the gratitude that we have in our hearts for your prayers, for your supports. This is one of the very first churches that took us on for support when we were doing deputation. So without you guys, we would not be in Argentina today. So we're extremely grateful. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my wife here tonight to embarrass and to make stand up in front of you guys. But, um, you know, it, it also feels strange traveling without them because I feel like I don't have anybody to get on to or chase around the church or tell them to sit down and be still and be quiet. And I don't have my wife to tell me where I'm supposed to be and help me remember people's names because I remember all your faces. But if I say, hey, man, it's good to see you and I don't remember your name, I apologize from beforehand. But uh, my wife is also not here to tell me how to dress, so I decided to wear my Argentina jersey tonight. So she, she couldn't tell me not to. But um, as Pastor Petsky was preaching last night just about worship, you know, it was going through my mind how, how this translates to our people in Argentina. And one of the things they worship is what you guys would call soccer. It's really football because it's a sport that's actually played with your feet, right? So, <clears throat> but their worship is towards that. And soccer for them, football is beyond, uh, it's beyond a passion. It's a religion. It's something that drives. And so, um, you know, they're excited about winning their first World Cup, and uh, they're, it's, it's, it's something that they look at beyond everything else. It's, it's their idol. So as he was talking last night, I understood exactly what he was talking about and the things that we worship that aren't the Lord. And so being in Argentina, our goal is to get people to know the Lord, to be able to take Christ to people who may have never heard about him before they've heard stories but they've never heard a clear presentation of the gospel right and so god took us from cordoba city where we thought we were going to start our church to rural argentina as we were focused in on where god wanted to take us we started noticing well hey this missionary is in buenos aires and five minutes away there's another missionary there and five minutes away from there there's a church that's been established for a hundred years and here in cordoba city you know you've got this line almost like an, an x in the middle of cordoba city where you've got churches lined up that are covering the city people that are ministering to them and a good pastor friend of mine who is a bible college professor back whenever I went to Bible college in Argentina, he said, I want you guys to come out to this town that's 10 minutes away from us. I just want you to drive around in this town and I want you to tell me how many churches are ministering to the people in this town. And there wasn't one. And we started looking at the next town over and the next town over and we started looking at rural Argentina. Argentina's divided out differently than a lot of Latin American countries. They're, they're piled up mostly in Buenos Aires, 14 million people <clears throat> in the area of Buenos Aires. And then the second largest city only has three million people. That's Cordoba City. And then you get outside of that and it's just small pockets of people all around that don't have one person to give them a clear presentation of the gospel. There's no one praying for them and there's no one to take Christ to them. And so God has burdened us with the rural areas of Argentina. It's kind of missionaries flip backwards on its head because, you know, they, they tell you in all the missionary books you're supposed to go to the big cities and where all the people are. And God just burdened us to go where people aren't going already to take the gospel to them. So that's why we're in the town of Balnearia. Can you say that three times fast? Balnearia. It's, it's hard to pronounce. It's even a strange word for them in Spanish. It's kind of a, a, a made-up word. But where we are, there's no culture of Christianity. There's not a church on every corner. There's no sense of, hey, you know, I, I used to go to church when I was a kid. I know that I need to get back in church. You'll never hear that where we're at. Um, something that somebody reminded me of the other day, I think it was you, brother. We, um, something that my wife had said the last time we were here, um, that she was the only Christian in her church, in her school of about 700 kids whenever she was growing up. Well, that's my kid's experience right now. They're the only Christian, the only true believers that are in their school right now. And so I just ask you guys to pray for our kids because it's an opportunity, and, you know, we see it as an opportunity to to reach out to their friends, to reach out to their teachers, to reach out to their, to their parents, but there's also that ungodly influence that's around them that they didn't really sign up for, that I just stuck them into because God called us to go there and God called me to go there and they just got dragged along with it, right? So pray for our kids because it is 
a challenge for them, and it is a, it, I don't know how to, to express what I want to say exactly, but it's a, an opportunity, it's a privilege for them to be able to be where they're at and be that Christian influence, but it's also a, a challenge for us as parents to send them out among the wolves and to, to have them there and, you know, just being surrounded by that. Where we are, the area where we are, is obviously a very strong Catholic influence around us. So most people know that they're sinners, but they have no idea how to get to heaven, other than what, you know, the, the works that they think that they have to do to be a good person. On an average, it's not like going into another Latin American country. Um, I really believe that God is working in different areas of Central America Revivals happening in, in Mexico. You can go talk to somebody on the street in Mexico and they're just hungry to hear the gospel. It's not the way it is where we're at. They would rather, they, they, they like to hear you, they like to listen to you, but I've got what I believe. I already know what I think. I, I don't really think that I need to hear what you're saying. And on average, it takes anywhere from seven or nine times of hearing a clear presentation of the gospel before someone will make a genuine decision to say, yes, I want that or no, I don't. And so what our struggle is, is to really present a clear presentation of what the gospel is, how you can come to know Christ. Stop depending on yourself, your own works, and trust in Christ and him alone to save you from your sins. And so that's something that the groups that are going, that's, that's going to come down, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you, but I'm even more excited to get you down to Argentina and let you see what it's like where home is for us. And so that's, that's it's going to be really exciting. I'm excited to get you guys back there. But that's something you guys are going to confront. And what something that I really want you guys to, to just focus on is take your, your wristwatch and set it aside. Don't worry about if we make it to the field on time or if we leave the field on time to get back to wherever we have to be for the next thing and talk to people. Because the culture where we're at is it has the time is, is really not an issue but what they what really draws them in what really attracts them is connecting with somebody on a relationship level and that's something that maybe we've lost a little bit in our american culture because we've got to get there we can't we don't have time to to sit and chat and when we cross somebody in the street we say how you doing oh i'm doing great and they're really not but that's the 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 response the automated response that we're supposed to say but what really makes a difference for the people where we are at is when you connect with them on a relationship level and you're willing just to sit down with them and talk. Maybe you'll listen to them for a little bit and hear what they have to say, but then you'll be able to tell them and express the gospel to them and give that to them. So we thank you guys for being willing to pray for us. We thank you guys for being willing to give to what God is doing in Argentina. And we're really excited that now you guys get an opportunity to go and get down there and be with us. So um, here in just a couple of days, I'm going to turn around and go back there. Our people down in Argentina, they, when they heard you guys were coming, they were worried. And they were like, well, how are we going to talk to them? You know, what are we going to say? What, what, what are we going to do with when they're here? How are we going to be able to communicate? And I, it was funny because I think it was a Sunday, Sunday morning. I was telling them, you know, well, here in three weeks, remember, this group is going to come down, and whenever they come down, don't worry about it, because it's going to be easy to talk to them. You got Luke. Luke's going to be our main translator right there, and my son's eyes just got really big. You know, he's, he's 11, and his Spanish is good, but, you know, this will be his first mission trip. This will be his first time ever helping out, trying to help you guys communicate and translate. So he's excited, but he's also a little bit nervous. So whenever you guys get down there, you know, you'll have to, uh, you have to break him in as his first time being a translator. So he's going to be our main translator for the week, or at least he thinks he is <laughs> up till now. So um, that's where we're at. We're in a small area, two hours right outside of Cordoba City. If you look at a map of Argentina, you look right in the middle, in the heart of Argentina, there's a big blue dot that's a lake. It's the salt, it's the, the biggest salt lake in Argentina and one of the biggest in South America. But it's only 10 kilometers, which is about a five, six minute drive from our house. So you can find us really easy on the map as you look at Argentina. Just look for the big blue dot in the middle, and we're right south of that. So a little town called Balnearia, where God's raising up people. We just finished, um, uh, uh, two or three weeks ago, we finished um, some classes that we're calling Advanced Bible Courses. And it's really just a leadership training class for the next group of leaders that we're training to, to set up and be able to start new ministries next year. And uh, my goal, my desire is to be able to take that uh, advanced Bible courses and turn it into pastoral training. 
Because what we want to do is we want to be able to train guys up to go to the next town 10 minutes up the road or the next town 10 minutes up the road, the next town 10 minutes up the road that doesn't have a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church in their area to be able to win rural Argentina for Christ. So if you guys would pray for us, that is our, our goal, that's our mission, that's why we're there. And like I said, we are grateful. We're grateful for you guys being willing to support us this whole time. Your prayers for us are beyond, it's beyond what I can express to you in either Spanish or English, how important it is that you guys pray for us and, and what your prayers are doing in our area. So we're grateful, we thank you guys, and we're excited to get you down here before too long. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. What a privilege it is to hear from you and what God is doing in and through your family. And uh, excited to see First Bible go there. And, and uh, what a great time that will be. Psalms chapter 145 is where we are again tonight. Thank you, Brownie, for the privilege of being able to preach at this conference. And uh, my wife and I just uh, were talking earlier today on how hospitable, how uh, wonderful it is to be with this church and uh, enjoy the fellowship of God's people. And uh, it's really nice to not be at your own church and have the responsibility of being at your church. So it's extra fun just to, I know he, he's published that little booklet for you all to look at. I haven't looked at it one time. And uh, that's because I don't need to. I don't have to worry about a thing except for what he tells me to do. So that's been fantastic. Psalms 145. Uh, I've entitled the message here, His Kingdom is Forever, and we're going to see that in the text here. I want to read from verse 8 all the way through verse 16. I hope you know that when we go through the scripture, that really is our primary focus. What God's Word says is what we need to be listening to, and the, the truth of what is in this text is really what should transform and renew our minds and hopefully recalibrate who we are as a people. So let me read verse 8. It says this, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of the kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men His mighty acts and the glorious majesty of of his kingdom. Verse 13, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thou, thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that are bowed down. The eyes of all that wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. Let's pray together. Father, so very, very grateful that we have, you have given to us a book of truth. It's a light to our feet, the lamp unto our way. And God, we want to, we want to, we want to be able to see in this dark world how we should go and what we should do. Thank you for Cody, the courage that you've given to him to take his family and, and to hear that still small voice and to, and to follow you in obedience and, and red hot worship and, 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 and that the nations and even the, these rural people would know the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and have that opportunity to call upon your name. God, we rejoice in that. Would you uh, do a mighty work in the few moments that we have here this evening, God? I pray that your word would be open to all of us and that your spirits would speak and reveal truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, we continue our Acts 1-8 conference. Obviously, we're here for a missions focused, and uh, we focused yesterday first, of course, on the importance of praise to God, that worship we want to extol. And we talked about how David said, my God, that very personal way of thinking. It, uh, we weren't outsourcing it to, to a praise band or another group, but he's my God. And, and we talked about the reason for missions is important because worship is eternal, eternal. Many years ago, 
Uh, I used to wear glasses, and uh, you know, how many of y'all wear glasses or you use contacts or something? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I went through that, and, and then I had that LASIK surgery done, and my eyes were perfect. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you, you, you know, you, you get up the next day and you're kind of looking for your glasses and you open your eyes and you're like, oh, wow, I can really see quite well right now. And, and that's fantastic. Well, that was probably 20-something years ago uh, that I had that LASIK surgery. And, uh, you know, I, uh, my eyes have steadily gotten a little bit worse over time. Well, a couple years back, I, um, I went to the eye doctor and uh, I walked in. And uh, I made an appointment. I said to the, to the, to the person, yeah, I just want to get my eyes checked out. I'm, uh, when I'm driving at night, I can't see very well. And I don't feel like I can read the road signs like I should be able to read the road signs. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. So the doctor wasn't ready yet, but the assistant said, come on in. I'll, I'll hook you up to the machine. I looked in the machine. You know, they flip in little flippers up and down, you know. And, and uh, she got all done, and she looked at me, and she says, well, you have 20-20 vision. I said, well, that's odd because I can't see at night. <laughs> and I can't see a road sign. I promise you that, okay? So she put me back in there and flip, 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 you know, and we went through and all this kind of stuff. She got done and she said, yeah, 20-20 vision. And I said, okay. She said, why don't you just wait for the doctor to come by? And uh, so I sat there and the doctor came in and uh, introduced himself and said, hey, I hear you're, uh, you came in to see us because you have 20-20 vision, huh? <laughs> I said, yeah. I uh, told him, I, you know, when I'm driving at night, the lights are a little bit uh, different and I can't read road signs like I used to be able to read road signs. And he said, okay, let me check it out. And uh, so he put me in there and he was much more careful, changed things a little bit slower. And he finally changed things just a little bit. And I said, oh, that's perfect, right there. It was just a tiny little change. And that tiny little change brought clarity. It brought me the ability to see in the distance again and be able to read those road signs like I used to be able to read those road signs. You know, I believe the church is supposed to be able to see with clarity and have vision to see things down. Uh, Peter talks about uh, uh, losing that vision and not being able to see afar off. I, I believe the church is doing a lot of really good things these days, and, and, and the church has got its marching orders, and, and oftentimes the church has just got its head down, and we're just going forward, we're going. Uh, uh, but when we look up, we're just not seeing with the clarity that we need to genuinely see with. And, and as I look in the text here today, I recognize that the things that God is calling to us and speaking to us in these texts, these major truths, are really an adjustment to our prescription. If we would truly understand and know who God is, he adjusts our vision so that we can see with the clarity that we genuinely need. I want you to look in verse 12 here, and this is the one of the primary uh, sections I want you to see, and we're going to get back to the verse 8, but he says, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. That's the missional verse in this section right here. What am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be making known to the sons of men, to the people of this world, uh, uh, his mighty acts, what God has truly done in and through our lives. And if we're going to do that, we have to have a godly clarity to be able to rightly see in all of this. Our text is going to focus on doctrinal truths. I know we don't talk about doctrine a whole lot in church, but truths that are necessary for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. See, the Great Commission is, is not simply conveying some information about God and, and people accepting or rejecting that information about God. Uh, the gospel is about a, a broken relationship that bridges a great gulf between uh, God and, and mankind. It satisfies a, a, a relationship. This is not simply us going into the world asking people to uh, close their eyes, bow their head, and raise their hand if they want to go to heaven. We're not talking about easy believism or, or a cheap form of grace, if you will. Uh, th there is a deep clarity 
of real truth that the people of God need to have in order to go out in this world. And it's when the people of God are enamored with the fullness of who God truly is that we are uh, better able to live out and communicate the glory of God to the world around us. So we want to extol, we want to praise, we want to worship, we want to glorify God. I mentioned this quote yesterday, but the author said, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Worship is. That's truly what we want because God, at the end of missions, when this world ends, missions will be over, but worship will continue. But before we can go and, and rightly direct people to worship God, we must rightly know God. And, and it seems like, well, that's an easy thing. We all rightly know who God is. Well, well, that's the problem. We all have made an idea of who God is in our imagination. And so we, we go to Argentina, or we go to Zambia, or we go to Dominican, and we assume an, a, an image of who God is, and we then convey that, sometimes erroneously and sometimes correctly, to the people of this world. I want you to know, I, uh, I just did some uh, uh, preparation for a sermon I preached back in Rochester, and I found out this statistic, that 60% of church-going people in America don't believe in the person of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in the Trinity. I mean, I, 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 that's pretty basic, isn't it? I mean, to stop and to think, uh, well, I mean, well, who is the Trinity? Why do I need the Holy Spirit? What is this? Listen, we're talking about doctrine that is fundamental for us. 20% of Americans say the Bible is literal, which means eight out of 10 people that you walk by in the streets don't believe this is absolutely true or the word of God. And if you don't believe this, everything else is left to your opinion, your subjective idea of who God is. 80% of Americans do believe in the miracles of Jesus. Well, that's the fun part. Who wouldn't believe in that, right? 71% believe in heaven. I like that too. I mean, we don't believe in the Bible, but we believe in the miracles that are talked about, and we believe in the heaven that's talked about, right? 40% of people uh, uh, believe in the devil. Well, we don't like the devil too much, so let's not believe in that part. Only 35% of Americans believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. See, what we've we've done here is we've created a mixed bag. We kind of buffet shop a little bit what we like and what we don't like, and we push aside and we discard the rest. We like certain things about God. We like certain things about the life of Jesus, certain things about what the Holy Spirit does, and, and then we discard the rest of those things, and we discard the part of God's character in which he pours out judgment upon entire cities in which whole families are swallowed up by the earth because of their sin. Uh, we, we discard how the path to heaven is straight and narrow and incredibly exclusive. We like the part about Jesus healing and the casting out of demons and how he's so quick to forgive people, and that part we like. But we don't care much for the parts of the Scripture that include wrath and a coming judgment upon this world. We oftentimes like to think of, uh, of God as a divine grandpa that just is going to set us on his knee and give us everything we want. Any grandpas know what I'm talking about? Today we see more and more people deconstructing. Uh, maybe you've heard that term, this idea of deconstructing their faith and walking away from Christianity uh, because they no longer believe. To deconstruct is to realize uh, that your faith in God was built on supposed manipulation or biblical error. What happened is so many people tried to create an image of who God is, and that image of God let them down because it wasn't truly the biblical God, if you will. The truth is, God doesn't beat to my own drum. He, he's not looking for my approval in anything that he has written here or said. He is God, and he is God alone. And before we jump too far into this text, I want to bring out a, a, an important aspect in all that is being said. There, there's one word that is emphasized multiple times, three times in the text, 
And when we look in the Bible and we see God say something once, we should pay attention. But when it comes up multiple times, he's emphasizing it to really get our attention in here. God is putting a, a highlighter on it, and, and we must understand the value of that repetition that he is giving to us. See, often we look at the world around us through our lenses. And if our lens is not properly focused, then we're seeing things incorrectly. We're seeing things in a wrong way. If you're a poor person, you're going to look at the world around you as everything being out of reach. If you're a rich person, you're going to essentially see everything is, is below you. If you're an athlete, you're going to see everything in terms of wins or, or losses, right? If you're an intellect, you, you see things as, as linear. Everything's philosophical in your mind. Here in our text, David is looking through a set of glasses that sees everything in the view of the coming kingdom. And when we see things through these glasses, then our perspective in life is going to align with how God sees these things. It is time for the people of God to see rightly through the lens of the scripture and rightly understand the kingdom focus. And I want you to see that in these three verses right here. In verse 11, he says, they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom. Verse 12 says, the glorious majesty of his kingdom. And then verse 13, he says, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. See, when we have this right perspective in life, we are going to look at life through the focus of God's coming, glorious, majestic, eternal kingdom. And when that takes place, when our clarity and our focus is right and we put those glasses on and we look, we recognize that it's not me, it's not my kingdom, but I am working and I'm serving and I'm living for his kingdom that is going to come. I am there to build up his kingdom. Now, the world has seen some, some, some pretty impressive kingdoms over the years. You can think about the, the pomp and the power of Egypt's kingdom, but it's gone. You can think about the imperial might of Nineveh that's over, or the glory of Greece that has stopped, or the power of imperial Rome that has finished, or the empire of Great Britain that is a shadow of it once was, or the former Soviet Union, or Spain, or France, and Napoleon, or, or the United States that will soon lose its grandeur, if you will. Even looking back, David wrote this, and we can think about the Davidic Kim, uh, kingdom, which was a, a foreshadowing of the eternal kingdom that Christ would come. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come. Hundreds of verses in the Bible speaking, especially in the New Testament, about that kingdom. I love how Paul writes it. I'm going to read some of these verses for you. He says in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. He says to the church at Corinth, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. 1 Corinthians 6, he says, I do want to let you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians, he says, we've been delivered from the power of Satan and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. He tells the church at Thessalonica uh, uh, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you. He's called us to come into his kingdom and his glory. He says in that second book that we would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy, he tells his disciple that he will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. The author of Hebrews says uh, we are, receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Second Peter says it's an everlasting kingdom kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, this kingdom perspective is the focus that we must have if we are going to work to fulfill the Great Commission, the work that we are enlisted to be a part of for his glory of the king and his kingdom. So we pray, we fast, we serve, we give generously and sacrificially, not to make a kingdom here, but to invest in the eternal kingdom. 
the problem is my glasses keep getting smudges on them. And the smudges make me take them off. And when I take them off, I look around and I see Stanley Cups and I, and I look around and I see trophies and I see riches and I see Oscars and I see all these people with wealth and, and money and pleasures and all these things. And I, I think to myself, man, those are some really nice kingdoms. And, and, and for the time I put away my focus on his kingdom and the king of that kingdom, and I start working again on building my own kingdom. See, it's, it's nigh impossible for us to ever fulfill and go out on the Great Commission when we're at the same time building our own lives and our own kingdom. Are you following me? All of the things of this world are going to burn. And if you were to ask my opinion, I would say that's probably going to happen pretty soon. And many of us, we just don't see it because our glasses are blurry. We just keep walking like everybody else is walking, pursuing the same dreams, same trophies, the same pleasures of this world that everybody else is pursuing. And yet if we would put those glasses on, we would see that there is a coming king who has an eternal, majestic, and eternal kingdom that is worth our giving our lives for. I love the description of that kingdom. And by the way, there's, there's really no earthly comparison. There's really no way to put into perspective what that kingdom is going to look at other than this extreme glory and majestic perfection, a kingdom that will not fade or deteriorate or ever end, for it is the kingdom of God. It's not a kingdom that's going to ebb and flow like you can see the United States having these seasons of, uh, of greatness and then retract and then seasons of greatness and retract. No, the kingdom of God will never ebb and flow. It'll just flow. No deterioration, always perfection, always the greatness of God and that majestic glory that we are talking about. So when we talk about missions, we're not talking about just trying to make a better life for people or saving people from a miserable existence or helping people get the best out of their life. What we're talking about is for people to know the great king and be preparing for his great kingdom. That's what we're looking at here. For in the end... There's only going to be two kingdoms that remain. It won't be the United States. It won't be the Soviets. It won't be the Chinese. It'll be the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. That's all that's going to remain in the end. In the kingdom of light, we will walk in and be robed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to bow and to worship and enjoy his presence forever and ever. Amen. And in the kingdom of darkness, the wrath of God will be continually and gloriously poured out on those that reject him forever and ever. That's it. It's critical the people of God have the right lenses on to not only see the kingdom coming, but, 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 but live for that kingdom that's coming to all of us. And so we, we, we get the right prescription for our glasses by truly seeing who God is. Verse 8 of our text, look what it says. The Lord is gracious. You want to dial in your prescription? Understand God is gracious. Grace is to receive something we do not deserve. It is a gift that we did not purchase or earn. I love how he says it to, 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 in Titus chapter 2. He says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. He says it in Ephesians chapter 2, very similar, is that it's the gift of God that he has provided. Romans chapter 6 says something very similar to us. It is the forgiveness of sin without us paying for it. It is reconciliation to God without us balancing that side of the spreadsheets. God is gracious. He is full of 
compassion. Compassion is that feeling of uh, simply recognizing, be able to connect with the needs, the real needs of people. Matthew chapter 9, we see uh, Jesus looked out and he had, he had compassion on the people because they were like sheep with no shepherd. We look in the Bible, we see the Jesus recognize that in Matthew chapter 14, the people were sick and he had compassion on them because of their sickness. Matthew 15, it says he had compassion because of their physical needs. Matthew chapter 20, compassion because of their blindness. See, God's compassion, he looks out in the world and he feels a sense of urgency and sympathy towards everyone. He's not just healing and feeding and caring for the people. Jesus is compassionately leading people to understand who the good shepherd is. For those that are scattered, those that don't have a shepherd, we see the compassion of God. It says the Lord is slow to anger. And we have a good God. Slow to anger. I don't know if you've ever been driving on the streets, but there's, there's people that are quick to anger right? If, 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 somebody, if somebody moves into their lane a little bit, or somebody uh, is a little bit too colorful for them, I mean, rage takes over, as if it's a righteous thing to become angry. One of the, one of the characteristics of our God is that he is slow to anger in that way. He is of great mercy. This is probably one of the greatest characteristics of who God is. I had a person come to my office and sat down with me and said, I don't understand why, why bad things happen to good people. Tell me why. I don't like it. Uh, he's going through some real hard things, and he's looking at a world that is full of evil, and he's looking at his life saying, saying, why are these things happening in my life? Where is God? And I said, you know why bad things happen to good people? It's because God is merciful to everybody. And if he were to take the mercy away from everyone and we all got what we deserved, none of us would make it through the morning. God is of great mercy. Verse 9 in that same text in Psalm 145, it says, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. It's, it's these words all that sometimes stump me in the Bible a little bit, right? He, he's good to all? Man, that's a big statement, right? I like what Paul says in Romans chapter 2. He says, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? God is good to all people, not just a select group of people he's chosen, but the goodness of God is for all people every way, in some way or another. And the goodness of God is part of who his character is, and that character doesn't change based on our nationality or our skin color or our age or ethnicity or even our religion, by the way. God is still good in his character. It means the Lord is not evil. He does not love sin and cannot even be tempted by it. Divine goodness and divine justice walk hand in hand, by the way. It's part of his moral character. Goodness also means that God abhors evil. So punishing evil is intrinsic to what it means for God to be good. So when we speak about God being good, we in one sense know that God sent his only begotten son into the world that whosoever shall believe on him would not perish and have everlasting life. And we say, God is good. And the other side of that coin is, and whosoever would reject the son of God will not have life, but eternal judgments. And God is good. Because if God did not punish sin and wickedness, he would not be a good God. God is good all the time. All the time. We cannot make up of God of our own imagination, if you will. The Bible declares the truth of God and we see the truth and it changes the prescription on our glasses. It brings clarity so that we can see afar off. We can look and we can see that kingdom is coming, that majestic, that glorious, that eternal kingdom is coming. And so focus on those things that are genuinely above. Verse 10 in our text, it says, all thy works shall praise thee. 
thy saints shall bless thee. After these attributes and, and the understanding of the, the kingdom and the, and the truth about who God is, he says, let's go back and worship God. After now we have our glasses on, it's time to, to, to bless and to praise God and to, and to sacrifice. The saints of God will bless the Lord for who he is. We bless the Lord, by the way, by honoring him with our lives. By living out the scriptures by faith, we bless him. We sacrifice and we give generously and we go and we do. We offer thanksgiving and we sing praise to him as ways of blessing him. Verse 11, now we go back to personal praise. We go back to, to missions for we know worship is the fuel of missions. It says in the text, it's the, the people of God that shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. Man, we, we can get excited about a football player or a race car driver, or excited about a new tool or a new device or a new vehicle. Or Man, you've ever listened to a guy talk about a truck or a teenager who just got their car. Man, there's, there's this intensity and there's excitement that goes on. When I was a, a young boy, my sister was dating this kid and uh, she didn't really like him. But uh, he had a cool car, so he would come over. It was this Chevelle, and, um, you know, since my sister didn't really like him, um, I was like, well, let's go out in your car, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, so one day, you know, he's got this Chevelle, and, and we go down the, this uh, wide-open road. He was weird, but he had a Chevelle, so I was like, let's do this, right? And uh, so we got down there. And he hit the gas on the thing and that carburetor, I don't know if you know what a carburetor is anymore, but a carburetor opened up on that thing and it just fueled up and you can feel the power of that car and the 454 horsepower engine came to life. And I, I threw, it threw me in the back of the seat and this crazy guy just started flying down the road and I watched that speedometer just go like this and I thought to myself, wow. The power of this thing is unimaginable. I never forgot that story. That thing was, that, that vehicle was powerful. You know, there's another power that I've never forgotten as well. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is what? Say it with me. The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. See, there's a power of God, and it's the power of God that transforms my life. It transforms your life. It's easy for me to talk about that Chevelle and those 454 horsepower engine that, wow, the power of that. But you know, that wasn't anything compared to the power that transformed this life by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Vince Lombardi trophies, Stanley Cup trophies, Oscars, the glory of all of these trophies are going to fade away. But the glory of the power of God will only get more clarity as we get closer to that day of salvation. Are you with me, church? I don't know what happened in my life. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what happened. All I know is Jesus changed everything. I sometimes, I like to read theology, I love to read my Bible, and sometimes I just look and go, I don't get it. Wow, the gospel changed my life. From these attributes, we go back to the idea of praising the Lord. Why? Because our praise must have substance to it. Without doctrine and without truth, we're just waving our hands in the air and we're excited in our hearts, but we have no true understanding of who God is. We are to worship him in spirit and in and according to divine truth, according to his ways. And we, when this takes place, we are naturally and wonderfully going to be awed by who God is and his attributes. That's why we worship him. Because the Lord is gracious. He's long-suffering. He is a good God. He is merciful to people like you. He's gracious 
to people like that. Wow. Now why do I worship him? Because he's so good to me. And he does all things perfectly. That's why we worship the Lord. And now it's intuitive for us that we would make known to the sons of men his mighty acts. Why? Because we know him according to truth. We know him. It's not just formal theology, but it's a God that we relate to because his power has impacted us. So we make known his mighty acts. You know, there was a time in this world when the people of this world were in such a state of rebellion that God decided to wash his hands of everything. He told one man and his family to come together and to build an ark, and they spent a season doing that. And then for 40 days and 40 nights, raindrops came down upon the entire world and destroyed everything that had nostrils. God is gracious. God is full of compassion, slow to anger of great mercy, and he is good to all. There was a a time when the children of Israel were under the bondage and rule of terrible Pharaoh. God sent his servant Moses to set the people free, but Pharaoh would not let the people go. So God, through his might and through his power, brought forth the ten plagues against uh, Egypt that destroyed the land and the crops and caused suffering, pain, anguish, the death of the firstborn children, and, and revealed the absolute authority of who God is over all earthly powers and kings. Egypt would see the power of God. God is gracious. He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger and of great mercy, and he is good to all. There was a time when the people of Israel had had lost their way and were worshiping false gods. So the Lord sent a, a mighty prophet that challenged the false priest to a competition. They set up an altar and, and essentially said, here's the deal. We're going to build these altars. We're going to lay out the meat on the altar. And whoever's God can bring down fire, that's the true God that we will worship. And so all day long, the priests of Baal, they were out there. What were they doing? They were doing it. They were getting, they were going, they were singing. They even cut their arms and blood gushed out. And all day long, they committed themselves to their God and nothing. Elijah came back in there, built up that altar, came before all those people, and he said, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. And at that very moment, God answered, and fire came down and ate up that altar and that sacrifice and licked up all that water, and people knew the power of God. God is gracious. He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger, of great mercy, and he's good to all. There was a time when the Philistines were, were being bullied, or the, the, when the Philistines were bullying Israel, I should say. There was, a, there was a battle going out, and the Philistines had sent out this huge giant to, to uh, taunt and to mock and defile the people of God. And the armies of Israel were on, uh, on one side, and the armies of the Philistines were on the other. And the, the, the Israelites were kind of shaking and, and anxious and, and didn't want anything to do with going to battle. And all that did was embolden the Philistines, embolden their giants. And he just taunted and mocked Israel more and more. And finally, one teenage boy, not a great warrior, a man with great experience, a teenage boy shows up and says, what's going on? Why are you allowing that uncircumcised giant to mock our God? The king said, here, you, wanna, uh, you want my sword? You want my helmet? You want my shield? You want all this kind of stuff? He says, I don't need any of that stuff. This giant, he comes with sword and spear. He says, I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. And this boy reaches down and picks up a stone 
and whoops this giant. Why? God is gracious. He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger, of great mercy. He is good to all. There was a time when God saw the world living in darkness and under the control of Satan. And so God said, I've done everything I can. There's only one thing left I can do. I will send my only son into the world. And that's exactly what he did. Born of a virgin, this Jesus would turn water into wine, would heal the sick, he'd cast out demons, he'd feed the hungry, he'd restore the sight to the blind and raise the dead. And finally, he would give his life a ransom for many. He would be betrayed, he'd be abandoned, and then crucified on a Roman cross. But three days later, Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. And whosoever shall call upon the name of that shall be saved. The power of God would be available to any that would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A broken and sinful world would see the power of God through a lamb slain. We sang about it. That blood that ran down would bring victory. The devil thought he was winning everything. But three days later, up rose the Son of God, victorious over all. Amen. Why? God is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, of great mercy, and he's good to all. See, we must make known the mighty acts and the power of God so the world around us can extol, praise, and worship. Yes. So the world around us will know his kingdom is forever. It's not like the Egyptian kingdom. It's not like Spain or France or Great Britain. It's not like the United States. It's going to come and it's going to go. His kingdom will never ebb and flow. His kingdom will only ever increase, for it's his glorious kingdom. Let me ask you, do your glasses <laughs> have smudges all over them? When you're driving at night, are you like, well, I can't see a thing right now? Maybe you need a new prescription. Maybe you need to go, oh, I got good vision. If you had the right vision, you would see that there is an eternal king that is sitting on his eternal, glorious, majestic kingdom, and we would not be enamored with the things of this world, and we would focus and seek after his glory and his eternal kingdom. So I ask you, how's your prescription? Do you really know who God is? Or have we just continued, even in our little Baptist churches, to make up a God that satisfies us? Or are we really focused on the God who is and was and always will be? Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so very grateful that you give us an opportunity to, to recalibrate our lives, to renew our vision, and to be able to see with clarity. God, forgive me for the times that I've made life about me and building my own kingdom. God, I believe that you're coming very soon, and Lord, I, I want to be ready for that. I want to be focused on you. I want to honor you. I want the, the world to know who you truly are. And so, Lord, help us that we might be infatuated with your power, and we may declare your mighty acts to the sons of men of this world. Allow us to go forth in your power and in your might. Give us clarity and understanding based on your truth. Reveal that to us, Holy Spirit of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with us?